trustable narrator. Okay. Um, start. We good? Uh, wait a minute. Oh, good. Okay. So it is indeed good to be back to see everyone uh, here. Um, okay. So I will tell you about recent work, um, which really occurred over the pandemic, uh, which is not the typical thing that I usually think about for most people who know at least some of the other works that I've, that I've done. So you can say this is some weird pandemic uh, revolt. Okay, um, so this is work with Pierre, who is also from Saclay. Um, and and in, in, in preparing for this talk, I was asked by a few people to explain in some detail how we construct solutions and why we can construct anything. So at parts, this talk will be more technical than it would necessarily be, uh, but please bear with me. So some broad motivation of at least why I started thinking about this is when um, gravitational waves came out, there was, it was very clear soon after that there is a whole new field of science that's emerging, which we should call gravitational spectroscopy. And this will be exciting even more so in the next couple of decades. So the question that immediately be became clear is these machines are going to observe new compact objects in nature. Right? The, it's a, the fact that they were already dark told us there are new compact objects in nature, which we generically call black holes. But there is a broader question you, ask, you can ask is, we know we should expect black holes already, but what should be the full spectrum of ultra compact objects in gravity that may not be even black holes that could even show up. So, you, so this, this question, when you try to ask it, then you have to sort of understand what this should mean in, in a generic theory of gravity. Another motivation was, is also that from string theory, as we all know, and the microstate program and the fuzzball program, and also in holography, we are all used to thinking about coherent states of, of, of gravity, which are going to be smooth solutions, where in holography they describe specific states. In the microstate program, they describe black hole microstructure, as we are in this conference. Just to be spectrum, you mean, for example, the most? No. Quasi spectrum here, what I mean is a set of states, specific states, specific solutions. I shouldn't call them states because I don't think I have the right to at this, at this moment. But you could just ask, what are the solutions? Of, 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 of gravity that are smooth, horizonless, non-supersymmetric, and can be astrophysically interesting. So you're just interested in the space of solutions? Just, yes. So at this level, it's just space of solutions. And then there is this broader question in, in the microstates program and, and in the fuzzball, and also in, in holography, where you can ask, are there non-BPS? Uh, well, we, already it was understood that non-BPS uh, microstates are, are, are there, but what is the general space of them, what they should look like? And for the case of holography, it's interesting because you can ask questions about how should you do non-supersymmetric ADS-CFT to do precision non-supersymmetric ADS-CFT, ADS where you have to have more specific uh, non-BPS solutions that you can play with. Okay, so then th there is this other question, can coherent states of quantum gravity exist as non-BPS solutions of classical theories of gravity itself. Of course, this question is, is quite loaded because when you ask it, you have to worry about question of stability, um, which, is, which is super, super important. But even before you go there, you can just ask a simple question, can you make them? Can you make anything, right? And this is what this talk is mostly going to be about. So from uh, another sort of motivation that, 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 that I also spend quite a bit of time thinking about. This is coming from the astro point of view, and we had a very nice uh, introduction by Daniel uh, a few days ago, which is that um, are there controlled examples of solutions that, are, that we would call black hole mimickers, right? So why is this interesting? So we, 
there's GR black holes, which could be simulated, could be studied, and, and you can use this to try to look for things that are like GR black holes in your machines. But one sort of question that's interesting is, how do you look for things that are not black holes? How do you, dis how do you know that you have new objects that are not black holes if they would show up to your machine? So this, this second motivation then ask, can I make new types of solutions that are ultra compact that look like black holes to first order, but then are different in a way that I can quantitatively uh, compare, okay? And of course, once you have this, 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 once you have such a structure of mimickers, then you could ask, what are, what are the observational properties in the spectroscopy? Notice that when you ask this question, you're not necessarily required to have a quote unquote a solution that exists in a theory of quantum gravity and so on and on. What you really want, you want to have a way of quantitatively comparing a black hole versus other in, in, in a way that's useful for observation. Okay, so <clears throat> there, there's of course, then there is a question coming moving from the sort of more lowbrow astro to again, a question that would be interesting to our community, can quantum coherent states of gravity that are not black holes be microstates and then also show up? Can, are there coherent states of gravity that are not at all black hole affiliated somewhere in between um, uh, uh, things that are like compact object made from matter to things that are like compact object made from gravitational states? Um, and even broader, the, the, the conclusion you should come from at least asking these other question is that if such a state exists in the real world, like a fuzzball or something like this, one sort of good lesson in physics is that things that are ultimately observable should have broad principle that allows for their existence, right? There should be broad rules why I can make them. It shouldn't require me to know all of the edifice of string theory, all of the edifice of supergravity to be able to say that you can have compact object in the real world. There should be some very lowbrow, bottom-up perspective, effective picture of why these things uh, are there. So another goal is to have a generic mechanism in gravity, which allows us to actually construct and study these things uh, on their own. Okay. So, as soon as you ask this question, then this is, comes to the broad statement that what you want, you need to have a picture that allow you to construct solitons in, in series of gravity. These must be asymptotically flat, smooth, and horizonless. They have to have finite energy density, classically stable, and also you want them to be metastable saddles of the gravitational Euclidean action from a quantum gravity point of view, so you can at least trust how you play with them. Okay. As soon as you ask this question, and of course, as we know, if you don't have supersymmetry, you have very nonlinear PDEs, so good luck. So this is, a, I guess, a very technical, technical uh, 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 issue. It's, no it's not necessarily a no-go, but there is also a no-go theorem, which tells you that, uh, which goes way back from the start of GR, which tells you that if you have asymptotically flat, topologically trivial, globally stationary, so no horizons, then your space-time must be flat, right? You can't have any localized energy density in four dimensions. Of course, this picture was revisited recently. So this, the, in a very nice story, which actually made an impact on me, this is while Nick and Yosef were paying me to do work when I didn't work on this stuff. <laughs> but this paper, of course, made, made an impact for the following reasons. It sort of decouples the existence of solitons away from supersymmetry where we naturally have constructed them, right? It told you that what are the sort of ingredients that you would need. It tells us that you need to have interesting topology. You need to have some Maxwell-type fields to support them. And most importantly, you have to have extra dimensions to be able to construct these solitons in, 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 in gravity. So then from these sort of very basic ingredients and from the fact that if we expect uh, microstructure to exist beyond supersymmetry, I still want to say that they should exist from broad principles. Then that means that we should find them in very simple theories 
of 4D Minkowski with extra circles and just Maxwell field. Right? If they, so, so this is the minimum that we need. Then if I just turn on the minimum, I better be able to find a way to find them. Okay. So from mathematics, we know how such a thing could occur. These things could occur because if you have a flat space with some tori, we know that if you have circles that shrink and you look at zero section of those guys, you get interesting topology emerge. <laughs> or say it another round, if I have interesting two cycles that exist in some geometric backgrounds, those usually emerge at zero sections of some circle fractions. So intuitively, the picture you should have is that you should have some locus in external 4D space-time, where along such a locus, you have uh, uh, some circles that collapse and do funny things. Okay, so this would be the broad picture why you might expect this to happen. So the question now, can you construct such a regular geometry? Okay. So any questions so far? Okay. <clears throat> so, so, okay, so now I'll just jump in. To, to explain at least the result is I will start in, 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 in 4D Minkowski with a torus vibration. So this is a, if not the simplest, I can do 5D. Uh, I can just do a Calusa Klein background where, where things could work, but I will go 4D with a, with, with a torus for reasons that'll be obvious in a bit. The observation that we had early on was that if we consider, take this background with the following ansatz, um, where you have some 4D base, with, uh, which is an S1 fiber over 3D uh, axially symmetric space time, where you have one of the circle is outside with the time direction. So this is a, all functions depends on rho and z. And we allow ourselves to turn on some three form flux because this is a 6D. We can allow ourselves to turn on a three form flux. So here, F3 could also have a, 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 a its Hodge dual component, but we're just going to keep it magnetic for the sake of argument. You can have an electric component. Um, the observation that we made early on is if you take this system with this specific ansatz, which seems to look fairly generic, that the Einstein's equations decouple into different sectors. You get that the warp factor in front of the time satisfies some log Laplace equation, and there'll be a good reason why that has to be that. But then this labeling of Z and H, Z1, H1, Z2, H2, what it tells you is that actually the, the Z and H sectors will form closed equations that don't talk to anything else. Right. So the, the, the nice thing that you get with this ansatz is in, 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 in which is which is non BPS is that you get the Einstein's equation decouple into three sectors, which involve one pair of warp factor and, and, and flux and another pair of warp factor and flux. And the last comp contribution, which is new, which sort of determines this 3D base which you can actually show that once you solve, once you have solutions to these guys, nu is completely fixed. In fact, the equation for nu has an integrability con condition which are implied by these other equations. So the, 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 the metric on the 3D base is completely fixed if you can take these different sectors and solve them explicitly. The interesting thing about each one of these sectors is if I just pick one of them, it will satisfy some nonlinear PDEs as we expect, but the 560 metric. metric. Okay, okay. I can send you the slides later if you want. Hmm? <laughs> now, no one is as fancy as she is. Yes, sir. Okay, so the, 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 so, so the, the nice thing about each one of these sectors, you do get nonlinear PDEs because we expect that. However, if you study these equations more carefully, you find that they're equivalent to the vacuum Einstein's equation for four-dimensional axisymmetric space-time. That somehow this 6D structure 
have, have these subcomponents where each one of these components is equivalent to some 4D Einstein Maxwell theory. Hmm? Oh, new I is just part of the base. So new here is going to have several, it will have contributions from each one of these different sectors, right? So I, I've, I've included it here for completion. Again, it's, a, it's, a, it's going to be a function that is completely determined as soon as you figure out what these other guys are. Good, good, good. This, this is the new, so if I go back to the 6D here, so this is a lack of resolution in my talk. So new as given there is going to be a sum of these new eyes. And then the point that each one of these sectors will come with its own new. Each one of these will contribute to the 3D base, but and that contribution um, is, 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 is linear. Right. So this is, a, this is a sort of nice organizational thing. But the point is that here, so this is why I have a semicolon for it here. If I look at the equations for, 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 one, for one sector with its associated new, these equations are actually equivalent to 4D uh, stationary axially symmetric Einstein Maxwell. So this was rather surprising that somehow I take this 6D thing, it's messy, it has many different parts, but it decomposes into three sectors. Each one of them is equivalent to some funny embedding of four-dimensional Einstein Maxwell in 6D. This is not a calusa clan reduction or anything, but it shows up. <clears throat> and indeed, here I've just written them. They're nonlinear equations. Uh, one important observation that's going to play out is that, hence why we're calling this charge vial, when I turn off H, meaning the magnetic field, the, the electromagnetic sector, the, 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 so this right-hand side vanishes, the, the Maxwell's equations are gone. This reduces to the vacuum vial solution, which were studied by Amparan and Rael in 2001, and that plays a huge role in our constructions. Okay. So another thing that is interesting about this 4D Einstein uh, Maxwell's equation, this is like probably the oldest equations in GR that's been studied. So if you go back to the 60s, 70s, all the way back, people studied these a lot. And in particular, there's a lot known about them. For one, they give you, so those same equation encode all the vacuum black hole solutions that we love. They include the majundar papa true solutions, which are multi-center static solutions that are known. Um, they admit integrable structure, so there's a full Gerov group that's acting, which is very interesting. And a consequence of this integrable structure is that you have an inverse scattering method that's, been, that's existed since the 70s, which can be used as a, multi, as a solution generating technique in GR. So what this also allows you to do is what allows you to construct multi-curve solutions, right? multi rajanorsham solutions, black Saturns, and all of these things are just good old non-supersymmetric solutions in, in, in gravity that's been known for a while. And of course, these equations also map to Ernst equations, which also have been studied a lot. So the problem gets reduced to, to, to something from which a lot of literature exists that we can tap into to, 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 to make new stuff. So even though now you have these different sectors, so now comes a bit of fine tuning, there is a way that they talk to each other, but not in a SPDE, but in a more algebraic way, which is that now I have this, this six-dimensional ANSATS. Um, I want to be able to impose boundary conditions or internal boundary conditions that does specific features that I want. For example, if I want a horizon, I want to be able to have this combination diverge while keeping everything else finite. And as you observe, you always have three sets of functions associated to three sets of isometry directions. So you could actually always find a boundary condition that, that blows one up and then keep the other ones finite. Go ahead. Good, so, so, I'll, so this is 
point. So here, so if, if I want to have circles shrink at some locus, so if I want the Y2 to shrink, I want to blow up V2. But then I want to keep V1 to be finite and then W finite. So I have no horizons and, and Y1 doesn't shrink. So, I, so no horizons just means that I want to keep this combination finite, the locus where, they, where these warp factors blow up. So you have three functions, three sets of boundary values, so you can do it. Yeah, yeah, so uh, I'll come back to this point. So I can, sh so, so, so if I just look at it, since I have three different sectors and I have three different uh, boundary conditions to impose, I can choose to collapse Y2, I can choose to collapse Y1, or I can choose to collapse the time direction. I don't think, I'm not sure there's a very, a, at least I don't have a very deep reason why it worked out to be this way, the three sectors, three directions. I mean, I, I understand why it works. It's followed from the vial structure, but it would be interesting to, 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 to see whether there is another deeper physical principle why. Okay, so with that, let's try to see how we build stuff. So our starting point, again, is then to just understand these equations. And as I just said, without specifically showing you, there is, these have a lot of integrable structure. And one of them we discovered early on on our own, and then we found out people knew about it since 1955. So I'll tell you about this. Um, so if we look at this equation, you can just check by inspection. Um, you, 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 you can try to, we can solve them in the following way. Let's consider a pair of uh, functions X and Y, which satisfy some linear equations on the base. And, and they're orthogonal, their gradients are orthogonal. Then this, uh, this sort of X and Y are actually known to solve, to, to correspond to the BPS multicenter black hole solutions. In particular, you fix the gauge field H or the gauge potential H to be the Y function. So you satisfy the linear relation. And then Z is harmonic and it's just proportional to X because X is harmonic. So you can just check that by I, if you plug this, into those equations, they're solved. And this is exactly the standard BPS solutions that, that, that many of us have studied and know and is familiar from, from a string theory. Now, the, the huh? this is not the Magenta Papa Petrie. That's, that, this, so, so here, I haven't said anything. This, so as I said, this is the, these equations are also the same thing as 4D Einstein microstatic. So we know that there is a multi-center black hole solutions, which are BPS. And for, those, for these equations, no, 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 no. So they're not the Majinder Papa Petri solution. Uh, we, can, we can come back to this point. Um, okay, so let's, so, so the, the, the key point here to, 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 to then understand is we want to build uh, uh, so there could be solutions that we can build. So let's, let's briefly continue talking about the BPS case. So when you have a BPS source, actually, it, when you have the BPS limit uh, of the system, the, the potentials Z satisfy our linear, satisfy linear equations, which is the Laplace equation. However, in the general vial system, what you typically get, meaning when you have the zero charge, you actually have log of the warp factor satisfy the Laplace equation. So, so what happens is that this sort of an equation will admit sources that are point sources along the axis, which generate smooth solutions. Whereas if you have log Laplace equations, they generate to, to, to the object where I get sources that are, that are segments. You get segment sources that leads you to, to, to smooth solutions. So there is a bit of a tension that we see here. Um, and what happens in, in, in this general setup that we just present is what you can show is that if you look at one of these ZH sectors, they will admit both extremal sources and BPS type particles. But, if, but then you also observe that the, this other 
the, the, the vacuum potential, which is this one, could only admit rod sources in order to create something regular, but also these other sectors, because they're so rich and nonlinear, could also admit rod sources. Okay. So this, this is the sort of way that, that, that you, you're going from this extreme BPS structure to this other vacuum-like structure, that the system actually likes to be more of what happens in the, in the vial, system, vial tensor, that, that, that instead of turning on point sources that we used to usually think about as generating solutions for us uh, that are smooth and regular, the set of sources that we have to consider are rod sources, precisely because of these, these vacuum uh, non-supersymmetric functions uh, that appear. Good. So if we now go back to the to this ansatz that we've that we've considered, uh, which which was the, the, the BPS ansatz, we can slightly generalize. We can still keep H to be this Y function because it is a charge. It has to it has to have some properties that allow us to say that. But we let the the the, the non-trivial warp factor Z, which satisfies this Messier equation instead be some function of the harmonic x instead of being linear as in the BPS case. It turns out when you consider such a more general ansatz for the system, you find that there are actually several solutions you can consider here, right? You, there is a solution which is, you have several transcendental solutions as a function of these linear functions, of these x functions which are themselves satisfy equation okay so this was rather uh, uh, surprising and to just give you a contrast right so when we uh, when we do when we consider the BPS solutions you you do have a linear structure but there the warp factor is just proportional to X right so the metric is completely uh, has a, has a linear dependence with X, which satisfies the Laplace equation. But in this non-BPS structure, the metric is going to depend on X, which itself has a linear structure, but in a rather transcendental way. So there is this highly non-trivial, um, non-perturbative back reaction that's happening that's, that's somehow still allowing you to generate something uh, uh, that is controlled. So, from, for the rest of the talk, I will, I will, strict, I will, I will consider the, this class of solutions of this, of this kind. The other one are interesting. They generate for you various types of complex metrics or real metrics with complex charges, which are interesting for other questions, but we'll, I will not go into those. So what's, what's the transcendental? I will, I'll come to that in a moment. Uh, I cannot comment on that specific one, but the rod sources that we'll consider will be finite. And I'll, but you could have infinite uh, rod sources, but those, those, yeah, I, I'll do only finite rod sources here, but I, we, we can talk about this point later. So when we, so, so in our earlier papers, we sort of understood this class of solutions, which allowed us to say a lot. But soon after, we actually realized that the solution was the same as the Majundar Papa Petru, which was known since 1955. So we're not rediscovering anything new. Uh, but also, then, if you formulate the problem in, in Ernst formalism, this solution, this class of solutions just, just pop out. So I'll refer to it as the Majundar Papa Petru. So how do we build stuff from it? So the, as I said, what we have is rod sources here. The, the, the construction that we will have is, uh, is, is going to take this warp factor Z, it is going to depend on the linear function X in a highly non-trivial way, in this way. So what is the idea here? So each rod is going to, be, is going to generate a linear function. It will, there'll be a, so, there'll be, um, a function x which satisfies Laplace's equation with a source that is given by a rod. Okay, so it generates uh, an explicit uh, 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 solution. Then for each rod, I can just write down its its 
contribution is X term. And then I exponentiate it and then plug it into the metric in this rather highly non-trivial way. The other functions, W, which is also sub, itself satisfies the log Laplacian, also depends on the exponentiated uh, uh, thing of, of X. So notice that here, uh, the metric functions depend on this. So, so, so in this picture that I have, I'm just sort of putting rod sources in a linear way, right? I'm just inserting rod sources in a, in a, in a very linear and controlled way. But the metric depends on, on, on T's in a highly nonlinear way. So these rods are, are interacting in a way that I, I don't think I can quantify in, in, in straightforward manner, but, but somehow the full solutions know how to account for such a non-trivial non, non structure, okay? So, so this to us was rather surprising that somehow you can have this, this linear structure that is buried very, very deep into the system uh, that, that where, 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 the, where the metric would depend on it in a way that I couldn't guess. I couldn't just sit down and guess this by, 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 by any sort of basic principles. Okay. So in fact, you can be completely explicit what these look like. So this, this, these, these, these harmonic functions that, that have sources as rods, you can, you can just write them down. So you can be completely explicit. And then once you write it down, you have all of these functions explicitly <laughs> given. So now comes the, the, the question that, OK, we, now we've, we've solved equations. Do we do what we wanted to do? Now to, to get different structures, I have to pick some asymptotics. So first, we want an asymptotically flat space. So what this means is that if I take this function and I expand it very far away, it should fix some properties, some coefficients. So here you will fix basically this parameter A in terms of B, as A is going to be cinch B. That's all that you need to, to guarantee that you have a asymptotically flat space for any choice of number of rods. Then comes the internal boundary conditions. You can have what we refer to a black rod or a horizon. If, I, if, if you look at this function, for each one of these sources L that I turn on, there is a weight associated to it, right? And the way that you pick different structure is by fixing a weight. So for example, if I fix my weights for this P in this very specific way, what this will do is that it's going to collapse the time direction, but it will keep the y1 and y2 circles the same. So that would be a horizon that gets generated. If I were to collapse, if I were to pick this other choice of weights from these functions, then I would collapse, for example, the y1 circle, but then I keep the time direction finite and also the other circle finite and, and, and so on. So you could ask, what are these weights? The weights that appear, this P is appearing in front of the, 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 the electric potential. These weights are exactly going to be a magnetic flux, right? So what this means is that each, each uh, rod source will have a magnetic flux attachment, which you can call effectively a magnetic charge associated to it, which is given by this P, which is fixed by the weight. Right, so I fix the magnetic field associated to each rod, then it tells me what collapses there, whether it's a time direction or one of, or one of the extra, extra dimension, extra circles in my system. So in, in a more cartoon way, if I pick the black rod, it gives me a segment where along that segment I get a horizon. If I pick a bubble of type one, so this here I depict this bubble of type one as being a region where the Y1 circle collapse, it gives me a bubble structure of, of one type. And if I fix this other weight, it gives me a different bubble structure. So now once you have all of this mechanics, then it's just an algebra problem. But before we proceed, ah, so there's one more asymptotic boundary condition that you could also pick, right? So before I discuss how you have an asymptotic boundary condition, which was flat, you can also have an asymptotic boundary condition that gives you ADS structure. 
And what that requires is that very far away, instead of having these potentials go to a constant, you just kill off the leading constant term. So these will go as some parameter, which we can compute exactly over R squared. And then in this case, actually the 6D is going to be asymptotically ADS three times S3. So we can also do asymptotic ADS. And then in the internal geometry, you can have an arbitrary set of rods, which would give you solitons in ADS. There are a couple of interesting points here. So the ADS3 is going to be made with the time direction in the Y1, and then a radial direction that comes from the 3D base. The S3 is going to be the Y2 direction, some angular variable that comes from the base and also the phi, the, the rotation on the 3D base. One interesting observation in this case is that if we just take a single rod source, this would, what that generates is actually just global ADS3 times S3. And one surprising fact is that that single rod source generates a BPS, global ADS3 times S3. Okay. Whereas if we do a single rod source asymptotically flat, that's not BPS, but a single rod source in ADS is BPS. So this is a feature where you sort of chopped off the flat sector and somehow then the spinners that, that you would interpolate from the inside to the outside, that the, 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 it's BPS, but since you don't need to glue it in the asymptotic space, it survives, okay? However, if I turn on all of the possible rods now that I can put inside the ADS geometry, you actually get something non-BPS non where you have the circle of the global ADS shrink in a controlled way. Okay. So here, of course, um, I only have one circle, so I only have one, one, one thing to shrink. But you could also take, take circles from the S3 that you can collapse inside. So the ADS3 and the S3 will necessarily talk to each other inside. If you have additional directions, those will also talk to each other non-trivially inside. Okay. So now with boundary condition fixed, the way we make solutions is I sit down and I state a sequence of rods. And then for each rod, I specify the weights, which fixes a charge for each rod. And then I just plug into my metric and I generate a solution that is not, that have no curvature singularity at all. So this, this, so, so this, this gives you a chain of magnetic rods, of finite rods, finite sources. Um, then the next thing to impose is regularity along each rod to make sure the circles are shrinking in a smooth way. So what this does, it gives you um, a set of algebraic equations, which you can think of as the force balance equation. It could be like, you know, the, the free body diagrams you would do when you were a baby physicist. You get a, you get a sort of, go ahead. This is where you apply con things like singularity. That's right. Right, so you get this, you, you get this, this, these regularity conditions, which removes conical singularity and, and, and allows you to get something smooth. And in principle, when we study those equations, we think they're solvable, although we can write down explicit solutions only at large n. So I will not talk about that specifically, but we think they're generically solvable because if you have n rods, these become polynomials of order n. So it's a highly non-trivial algebraic problem, but you could in principle put it on a computer if you wish. Can, can you embed these solutions in string theory? And if yes, is the interpretation of the roads just fundamental strings? Very good. So in this talk, I will say nothing about string theory and that is on purpose. Pierre will talk about string theory tomorrow. Um, uh, but indeed, each one of these sources, you can, so, so these rod sources, there, there's various cool things that happen when, when, you, when, you, when, you, when you try to study them. So first in the 6D, you can ask, is there a limit where I shrink a rod source to a point? And this you can do. And when you shrink a rod source to a point, it, it goes to some point particle type object, which can be BPS or, or, or so on. And then when we embed it to a string theory, those point sources become bound, D-brain bound states. 
of, of various kinds, and we can be very precise what that means. And then when you expand it to the rod, what happens is that you're taking the brain bound states and you're blowing them up to a bubble via geometric transition. Okay, so, you could, so this is a picture that we have um, that, that uh, Pierre might say something about it tomorrow. Okay. Good. So continuing just from this lowbrow GR perspective, here now, one of the sort of interesting observation here is that in all of these solutions, um, uh, the, 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 the charge, so each one of these rods has a mass parameter, which is associated to the lens, to their unbacked reacted lens. And then they have some charge, which is associated to the flux that lives, that lives on them. In these constructions, basically the, the, the ratio of mass to charge is fixed on, along all of the rods. And, 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 and this, 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 this point, uh, let's just discuss this point more. So what this means that in these solutions of basically having this sequence of rods in the majundar papa petru solutions of the equations, you actually have n minus one parameters that are frozen in just solving the equation, right? There are n minus one parameters that are just frozen in solving the equation, which were necessary to get this cinch equation. So you could ask, can you liberate all of those parameters? And this is exactly what is the role of this full integral structure that appears. So we have this inverse scattering and you have the Ernst potential. So which is a far more complicated set of equation, set of uh, structure of solving those equations. And, and, and here we get a very physical picture of why that had to come into play. That had to come into play is because we have this initial picture where you have these rod sources that you can stack. And when you, there are some number of parameters that are frozen, so there are some interactions between the rods that are frozen. But then if you go to the full inverse scattering, you can free up all of these param parameters. And then when you free them up, this allows you to do something cool where you can insert a, a rod and also dial independently its charge. So what this allows you then is to make a bound state of these rods where each rod becomes a bubbling structure you get a bound state of bubbling structure where each bubbling object has an independent charge. And to do that, you have to do, go to the full inverse scattering picture of this thing. Now, for those of you who've ever played with inverse scattering, it's an insane mess, but this is a very physical picture of why that insane mess had to be there and had to exist. And indeed, if you go ahead and, and try to use those techniques, you can construct a multi-rod systems where you can dial the charges independently and you can make things that, like, that are neutral. And neutral objects are interesting because neutral objects are the things that could be astrophysically relevant. Okay, so we have, for example, three charge objects that you can construct which are asymptotically neutral, uh, uh, which look like a short shield. And this allows you to talk about notion of a short shield microstate geometry. And, and Pierre will say something about that, hopefully. Okay. Any questions so far? Go ahead. Good. Come to that point okay. in a minute. Any uh, so maybe one more question of that. Do, if you had fermions in this theory, with these periodic circles, are the boundary conditions the ones which will create trouble at the tip? Or very good. Not? Very good. Very good. Very good. So your question is about spin structure, right? So in all of these solutions, you always in, in, in all of these solutions you can you 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 will always have the the um, the, the the antiperiodic boundary condition, which would imply that they, they would be unstable. So the question you want to know is: Are there other structures that, that you can pick that, that helps me solve this 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 problem? So so this is we have some calculations where we try to study this, but it's, 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 it's not it's not it's not published. But I, I think there are, there are choices of boundary conditions that we can pick simply from the fact that all of these solutions have limits where they become BPS. Okay. Um, yeah, so this is, a, this is something that I've been wanting to write down, to write up for a while, but yeah, 
I, I, if I haven't gotten to it. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, but that is a very important question, whether, whether, whether you have good um, spin structure that you can put in, into this geometry. So another question that you could ask is, okay, so we have this construction where we insert rods and, we, and, and from the data of the rods, we, we have a smooth solution. We know how to go from the case where we have fixed uh, charge to mass ratio, and then we can go use inverse scattering. There is another sort of more basic physics question you should ask is, is usually in GR, when you have solid pond solutions of this kind, you should ask, what are you, what are they doing? What is the role of them? It turns out in a very sharp way, this sort of a construction that we have is smooth, is, is re resolving something. And it, what it's resolving is, is a set of class of solutions which have singular horizons, okay? So one thing you can do is you can sort of squint, like, so here in this picture, we sort of carefully align each rod where at each rod, we, we have a controlled circle that collapses and so on to create a general solution. Suppose you sort of squint and just smeared over, over, over that structure. What you, what you then get is that um, the, the, what these solutions are doing, they're resolving a set of singular solutions where all isometries collapse, inclu including the time circle, right? So there's a family of 6D solutions which are asymptotically flat, which have singular horizons. And this family of solutions which have singular horizons are labeled by two parameters, their mass the, and some parameter D and their, and, 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 and their charges. And it turns out whenever we construct this class of solution, this sort of singular geometry is an excellent approximation up to scales that are the size of the extra dimensions away. So this was rather striking, right? So we have this picture where we have all this bubbling structure that we construct, but as soon as you move away from it, it just looks like this rather singular, horrible geometry. And, and the resolution that happens is, 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 is at the order Ry, where Ry is the asymptotic size of the extra dimension. So this fits very well with the philosophy of microstate geometry and fuzzball, where very far away, you, get a, you, look like a, you look a solution which looks like it has horizon and looks singular. But then when you come very, very, very close to it, then it sort of opens up to something else that is smooth and regular. And the scale that is relevant here is the size of the extra dimension. And you can check this by, in a very controlled way, and actually see this, see this, see, see this, see this play out. On another philosophical point, this is sort of interesting, right? Which is that if, you, if the claim is that when you approach near a would-be black hole that maybe you have to turn on all extra degrees of freedom. Naturally, you should expect all extra degrees of freedom that you don't include to just make the whole thing singular. If, they, if they're turning it on a scale of the horizon, it should just make everything singular at that scale. And this is exactly what we observe here, right? This, this metric is horribly singular exactly at the horizon. And as soon as you come at the scale of Ry away from it, it completely gets resolved and you couldn't make that distinction at the level of the metric. So it's, 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 it's actually sort of dramatic. You write this metric, it's very, very complicated. And then as soon as you approximate it a little bit away, it just collapses to something very simple of this kind. Okay, good. So, so that is an explanation of basically what these solutions are doing. So now I will turn, change, shift a little bit and talk about one extreme end in, some, in, in more detail, which is I consider the single uh, bubble solution, which corresponds to a single rod source where one, what, when, when, where one circle shrinks. So this here, I can do this, I can fix the different sectors to be, align them to be specific, and the problem here just reduces to a 5D Einstein macro solution where you just have a closed Klein bubble. So you can write the metric explicitly, which is rather nice. Um, you have some sphere, which is associated to, this, to, 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 the, to the bubble. You have a radius. 
And, 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 and notice that because you have both time and an extra circle, both of them could, 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 could degenerate. So you can have both a horizon if this function collapses or a bubble if this function collapses first. And you, of course, have a charge and a flux that supports everything. Okay, so you have a rather simple phase diagram for this case where when RS is less than RB, you have a bubbling, a bubble solution, which, which uh, with, with a soliton that's sitting at RB. When RS is greater than RB, then you have a black string solution. And then you have an RS equal to RB point, which is actually a BPS solution, which is ADS3, which flows down to ADS3 times S2. So this is the simplest solution. So you can analyze it and try to study it. So, so, what, so in four dimensions, if you reduce the solution in four dimensions, it just looks like a, um, a magnetized charged object, singular black hole with some magnetic field and some charge. And you can compute it after you impose all regularity conditions. So this is a mass and then this is a charge. I'm writing it for reasons that will be obvious in a moment. There is also an additional parameter k that you can allow, and this correspond to when you shrink the circle on the bubble, you could also allow it to have a conical defect, and k is a conical defect associated with it. So this will help highlight some important physics of this of, of, of microstructure and microstate geometry. So the parameter, so it's just some topological, and Ry is the radius of vector dimension. So we get to get a smooth non-singular, which is not, which, which, with no conical defect, you want k to be one. But then, if you observe the the, the flux that supports it, when k is equal to one, the size of the bubble is 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 constrained to be less than the diameter has to be less than the 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 size of the extra dimension of the asymptotic extra dimension. So this looks more like a topological particle than a black hole. Okay, so a single bubble solution, by the time you make it smooth and well behaved, it looks like a topological particle than a black hole. If you allow the conical defect on the bubble to be large, then you can make the structure large. And here you can interpret this conical defect, you can smooth it by using Gibbons Hawking bubbles. You can smooth such a conical defect by given talking bubbles, which we describe in our paper. And physically, what is happening is that this is telling you that if you want to make a big structure, that this is telling you in, in, in more precise sense why I can treat these bubbling solutions as some sort of microstructure, some sort of coherent microstructure that you can associate to, to these systems. That if I just take one of them, it, it wants to be small. It wants to be a single particle. But if I want to make a big structure, I have to take many bubbly, bubbles and create a big bound state. So if you allow k to be large, then you can make the size of the structure large, and then this looks more like a topological star, which is a big bubbling structure. This is a sort of a fake way to, to show uh, why, 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 why I should think of these individual bubbles at individual, state, in, individual states uh, relating to the question earlier. So, so as a consequence, in addition to having a frame where we can build large stuff, really the first sort of object that we have is what we would refer to as some topological particle to just give you a sense of what this object looked like. If you become very conservative, you take the size of the extra dimension to be you know, just above the string scale, right? That you can trust supergravity then the mass of such a thing is very large. It's like 10 to the 21 mass of the proton. On the other hand, its size is, is 10 to the minus 3 times the size of the proton. So this would be an ultra-heavy, ultra-compact particles, which somehow naturally should fit into the whole paradigm of microstructure and microstate geometry. So with, what do you mean? Single bubble? It, it, it's, a, it's a single bubble solution, but it's important to both have. So I, I'll come. I, 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 it's a 5D solution, and it's a 5D solution with a single bubble. So I'll come to this question. Which also, a charge, me. probably. Yeah. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a genuine Lorentzian 
solution in a Calusa client background. And it's stable. So I'll this okay. is the next slide. OK, thank okay. you. Go so, so I understand that when k is very large, you have, an, you have a conical singularity and the richest scalar diverges. But you're saying that you uh, use this Gibbons Hawking bubbles to resolve this singularity. Can you elaborate on that? Um, I can, but maybe I can, can we do okay. it after, okay. right? Okay. So the, the point is that if, if, if you have this conical defect, you can come in, you can rewrite the metric as a standard, at least the four-dimensional slice, as a standard um, Gibbons Hawking metric. And then the K that you see there, you can see this as the standard BPS um, K Gibbons Hawking singularity, which we know how to resolve. Uh, but but that, but that's detail. So this is a sort of a quick way to show you why you need a lot of bubbles, right? But 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 that would be a case where you sort of adding BPS stuff on top of something non BPS to make it big. Okay. Okay. So 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 then we can just study this this single simple object, this this particle for a moment. And and the way we study it is you 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 look at the gravitational the Euclidean gravitational action in the in the canonical um, uh, ensemble, and then you can just compute it explicitly. And when you do, you sort of get a, a potential of this kind both for the bubble and also for the black string, right? And this potential is going to exist in a region close to the BPS point, right? In a region close to the BPS point. You have a meta, you can have uh, uh, the gravitational action as a function of the parameters has, it looks like this. So you see that, so here in this case, in the case of the black string, a saddle exists when RS is greater than R, 2RB. And in the bubble case, a saddle exists when RB is greater than 2RS. And then outside these regions, the system is classically unstable and there is no saddle. Go ahead. A Gregory Lafam instability. Um, good, good. So the classical stability that I'm talking about here is a Gregory Lafam instability. So it doesn't, so outside here is there, inside here is fine. So to just take a cross section of this, of this thing, basically what you have is you, 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 in this region, you always have a stable, a metastable black string and an unstable one sitting up here, a metastable bubble and an unstable one here. And then exactly if you study the potentials, you take the extremal limit, the, the, the unstable ones disappear, which is what we expect to be to, 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 to happen when you have a when you when you have a stable solution. Right? The unstable one disappears. And this also tells you that when you turn on the charge, this region is, this, is, is, is what, what opens up. This is the cost of turning on the charge. It opens up this stable point. So, when, so to just sort of finish up, then one thing you can do, you can compare the free energy of the stable black string with the free energy of the stable black uh, bubble. What you find is that if you go to large temperatures here, you find that the, the black string is the thing that dominates, so bubbles will want to transition to black string at, at the thermodynamic level. But if you go to low temperatures, the, the free energy of the black string is, is dominated by the bubble, so actually black strings themselves will want to transition to these bubbles. So this is the first example where you have a bubbling structure with black holes where you can try to ask, uh, do they go between one another and in equilibrium? So this provides sort of a, this, this is the start of, of how we might expect to make a um, bubbling structure, even from things that look like black holes. Okay, so with that, I will end. So there is many interesting questions. So in this talk, I just restricted to the very, you know, simple case where I just have a 6D frame to just be able to explain what, 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 this, what this mechanism of constructing solutions and what these BPS structures are and what they look like. There are a lot of exciting questions one could ask um, relating the solutions in ADS and trying to do non-BPS holography. The, one of the interesting points here is that the actual starting point is always BPS. So the deformation that you would have to do is there are going to be non-BPS deformation of some 
of, 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 of a controlled thing. If you embed it in a type 2B, this is, would be some non-BPS deformation of the D1, D5 system that you're going to study. So, there is a so relating to this, so we can embed this in type 2B on T6 to get 4D object or M-theory on T7. So after our first round of papers, Pierre wrote a nice paper where it just showed that you can just embed it. And when you do, instead of getting two sectors, three that I described, you can get several different sectors. You actually have many different species of bubbles that you can construct and put together in some bound state. So the phase space grows a lot. So there's a lot of other exciting questions that we want to study. I didn't say anything about string theory, but there's a lot of fun stuff we can do in string theory. And you'll hear some aspects about this. And in particular, also the physical observables of what they should look like. So I'll stop here. Thanks. What about adding rotation to the? <laughs> that would be the. You can turn on rotation, but then we keep keep getting things that 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 cannot be completely regular that cannot be completely regular so but we think this is just lack of creativity not a fundamental things why no it's not no a, no no it's regularity it's regularity issues what well regularity well, numerics is regular is what do you mean <laughs> no 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 the question is not whether you could make things rotate we can turn on rotation it's a question of regularity, which is not a numeric. But to well, roughly, as you see, in various places, I, I actually have a collusive Klein mode turned on. So you can do some double weak rotation and make it to, to for example, for, that's the simplest thing you can do. Um, there, there are others, there are other, other ideas, but, but somehow the, trying to make our system rotate it, it like like the regularity issue that comes when you have a euclidean bubble versus a lorentzian bubble or horizon are, are actually physically different so there, there there's something that we don't quite understand but go ahead yeah it's me yeah oh. <laughs> okay. but but um but you know, there, there is the Weil Lewis Papa Petro formalism in four dimensions, right? And with rot that describes rotating solutions. Yeah, yeah. And you can make it regular. So, I, what do you mean by you are having problems with regularity? No, no. So, we, we, so the Weil Papa Petro solution to are static. The Papa Petro and Weil solution are always static. It's important to distinguish that. You have a magnet, you have a closed Klein monopole. And then that's, 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 a, that's a bubble where you can do the regularity. In our construction, you can have a clue client charges of that kind. The, the, the issue, the, the, as I was just saying to Nick, the simplest way to see that you should, be, you should try to do rotation. Let's see if I can go back to anywhere. Ah, here, right? You can just do a weak, double weak rotation here and here, right? And then this, you can try to make a rotation, right? Um, and you can do that, and you can find sectors where you can try to do this. You can map it to an Ernst system instead of being a real, it's complex, the whole shebang, nice. You can try to write down solutions, nice. The thing that becomes an issue is that um, once you have a, a, a time direction, you have different types of regularity condition that you would demand at the horizon versus when you have a bubble. So, so you have constraints on, 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 on how the spins, how large the spins should be in order to be, to be regular. And those are hard to satisfy. It, 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 it's, it's unclear whether there is some deep physical reason or whether we're just not being creative enough. And I blame Pierre for that. We have the solution. It is perfectly irregular. I mean, we have a bubble, but the problem is like a Euclidean care. You have twist periodicity where some circle shrinks. And, uh, and this twisted periodicity requires some conditions that I don't know why we cannot satisfy. So it's, let's say, almost regular. Everything is fine, but you have a twist periodicity uh, which causes problem, and we don't really know. And you are also studying one component. 
Uh, yeah, yeah. It's basically, what happens when you like there, there's a physical thing that happens when you turn on rotation. It looks like you have um, a string at infinity, so it changes the asymptotic. So you you can keep it, but then it changes the asymptotic as if you have a string sitting at infinity, and then you would want to remove that, and you can, and, and 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 we can. This is why I'm getting rid of him to hire a few people. <laughs> but nobody stops Oscar, you and you and Jorge to, to to basically just take their solution as seeds. And just put rotation by hands and do numerics. I mean, you know, nobody stops you from doing that. I mean, their boundary conditions are clean. You know, you can you can do. I mean, okay, probably it's a pentagon, but you know, it's a solution which is foundable by you know, by just numerics. So you can take their solutions. You know, put rotation by hand numerically, solve the body system, and just you know, find. This 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 we have. It's just these asymptotic strings that we can't remove. No, no, no. But you know, you can actually find smooth without solution without strings but by just putting rotation using using their numerical methods. Okay, maybe we can talk about this, but but that's but that's solving equations, not 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 regularity, which is algebraic constraint. Okay. I think we're over time, and people have to eat. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.